Oh, good morning, gang. Let's talk about people. People got problems. Problems got people. So we are building an increasingly complex society. Uh, Technologically, uh, our infrastructure is growing more complex. Everything from plumbing systems, electrical systems, uh, construction methods, construction materials, uh, occupational technologies, everything, everything we're exposed to on a daily basis is becoming more complex. A common example would be the automobile that I'm in. So the first car I can remember <clears throat> my mom had a 86 Caprice Classic. It's a, a boat. I think there's there's like a, I don't know, two to three hundred cubic inch engine. Uh, no computerization, analog radio, uh, manual windows, manual locks. Uh, it was a tank. All metal construction, plenty of room under the hood for you to work on it. Um, Little to no computerization, because again, this is mid-80s. If I think about that car compared to the car that I'm driving right now, this car has a television in it. Uh, This car has heated seats. Uh, Every engine component has a relay that detects when a circuit is broken and when fuses go out and when uh, a light bulb has blown. Uh, My windows go up and down automatically with the push of a button. My locks are powered. I have, uh, what, nine speakers in here. Like everything is more complex. And the car is doesn't necessarily give you a sense of the the gravity of of technological advancement. So there's something called Moore's Law, M-O-O-R-E apostrophe S, Moore's Law. And this has to do with computing power and the amount of space on a microchip. So there's a ratio, and I, I think quite simply put, they say that computing power doubles every four years. I could be mistaken about that. Um, please fact check me if you would. But this this gives you an exponential growth curve in technological innovation. If, if I double one, I get two. Double two, I get four. Double four, I get eight, and so on. So it begins to look like a parabolic growth curve. But like anything, infinite growth can't occur. Um, at least according to the the rules of our reality. So uh, hopefully that clarifies uh, technological innovation. I mean, you look at this phone um, at the at the onset of computational technology, a a computer with the amount of processing capability that this. I, I use an old iPhone 5. The amount of computing capability required to compare to this phone would take up likely an entire floor of a building. Giant computer banks producing tons of heat, highly inefficient. They need to be fan-cooled or liquid-cooled. It's, it's tremendous how much computing power has gone from massive scale to pocket size and this has happened in less than 20 years it's incredible how quickly technology is advancing human beings are different that's becoming an ever more controversial statement to say that human beings are different even something as seemingly obvious as differences between male and female has become contentious. Uh, We want to eliminate definitions. We want to eliminate uh, categorization. We want to eliminate 
any way that we differentiate between one thing and the next, one object and the next, one person and the next. However, there are some things that that prevents us from addressing. And those things are becoming increasingly important uh, politically, interpersonally, uh, in a number of ways. So one of the ways that human beings are different is in creative output. SS, hello. Let's take an example. You're on a, a basketball team, any sports team, let's say. You have... For, for ease of mathematics, let's say this team is a fantasy sport, uh, has a hundred members on the team. <clears throat> the square root of the number of players, 10, will produce half of the value of that team. So you can think of your monumental athletes, uh, your Michael Jordans, your Bo Jacksons, uh, Floyd Mayweather. These individuals produce a disproportionate amount of value in relation to the rest of the team. This is Pareto's principle, P-A-R-E-T-O. The square root of the individuals in a creative endeavor will produce half of the value. The square root of that group of individuals will produce half of its value. And so on, and so on, and so on. So if I graph value per capita, or the value produced by each individual, I start out at that minority of one, the individual, the Michael Jordan, the, the Wayne Gretzky. This individual is producing tremendous value, exponentially more value than those who are producing little value on the team. It goes down rapidly from Michael Jordan to the next player, let's say uh, Scottie Pippen, a, a Horace Grant, uh, a Dennis Rodman. And understanding the complexity of this, that all of these individuals have a different role. And within this one category, goal scoring, basket scoring, Michael Jordan produces far more value than anyone else in his field. But even within that category, goal scoring, there are individuals who are playing an integral role in getting Michael Jordan to the basket to score that goal. Perhaps there is another Pareto distribution for defensive prowess that places Dennis Rodman all the way at the top. Perhaps there is a another hierarchy within that Pareto distribution that places Horace Grant at the top for rebounding. So w there are hierarchies within hierarchies within hierarchies within hierarchies. And in any creative endeavor, people will find their niche, and if they are dissatisfied with the niche that they've carved out for themselves, they will create a new hierarchy within or separate from that hierarchy. So the square root of individuals produce half the value. The square root of those individuals produce half the value. The square root of those individuals produce half the value. So in a company of 10,000 people, 10 employees are producing half of the value for that company in terms of uh, products sold, in terms of dollars made, in terms of uh, benefits provided, in terms of value generated, generally. This Pareto distribution is inevitable. I would challenge anyone to find me an example of a creative pursuit, a creative endeavor of any kind, wherein the individuals within that endeavor do not match what I've just described, the Pareto distribution. It's, it's effectively a law of, of nature. Um, not observable nature. Observable nature follows sort of a different law, but it's it's just as fundamental, and that would be, um, let's see, the Fibonacci sequence. If you've, if you've observed plants grow over like a stop-motion animation or a, a long exposure film where you can see from above a plant it grows and it spirals out as it grows up. 
that mirrors a mathematical sequence called the Fibonacci sequence. So if I take 0 and 1, I get 1. If I take 1 and 1, I get 2. If I take 2 and 1, I get 3. If I take 3 and 2, I get 5. If I take 5 and 3, I get 8. If I get 8 and 5, I get 13, and so on. You're, you're adding the two preceding numbers to get the next number. And then you're adding the two preceding numbers to get the next number. You would exhaust yourself trying to find an example of something in nature that does not mirror this Fibonacci sequence. Um, facial symmetry mirrors this Fibonacci sequence. Fine art, uh, the finest art, meaning like the Renaissance masters, uh, mirrors the Fibonacci sequence. The wavelength of sound from the Austrian composers, the greatest in the world, mirrors the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, even, in, even in composition, the square root of composers produce half of the compositions. And the square root of those composers produce half of those compositions. Everything mirrors these. Whether that's an effect of something that's subatomic, or it has to do with the way energy forms itself around an atom, or if it has to do with uh, the physical world mirroring that Fibonacci, but the, uh, the, the, the supra-physical or the uh, metaphysical, the... Uh, maybe consciousness is governed by different rules and it mirrors the Pareto distribution. So, or perhaps there is an overarching theory, maybe, maybe this is uh, something one of you guys could research if you're interested in changing the world, a formula that integrates Fibonacci and Pareto that has predictive power. That's my gift to you, gang. Make yourself a Nobel Prize. So these, these laws more or less govern reality. And there's something that, that we're not addressing when we talk about individual human beings. When we talk about income inequality or uh, disparity in productivity or employment or, uh, or crime or wealth or um, occupational position or status or ownership, uh, number of children we have, all, a million things. We could examine a million different outcomes. And those outcomes are reliably predicted by IQ. And this is something that we don't want to talk about. And here's why. IQ is largely genetic. Personality is largely genetic. Your personality and your IQ are more or less set by the time you're four years old with some room for deviation, three to five maybe. So by about the age of four, your personality is set. Your habits, uh, the character that you have is pretty much set and there will be deviation from that as new information comes in, your personality changes into adolescence and adulthood, but you will not get much deviation from the standard from that point forward. So your IQ is more or less maxed out, your intellectual speed limit, let's say, is more or less maxed out at about the age of four. So everything that happens from conception to about age four shapes the person that you are, that you will become. If it's genetic, let's say estimates anywhere from 70 to 90% of your personality and your IQ are determined by genetics. This means that your parents' intelligence and personality were determined by their genetics and their parents, and their parents, and their parents, and their parents. So you are the recipient of millions of years of genetic information. And that genetic information has not just a DNA code, but an epigenetic code that exists on the surface. Epi just means above or on top of, on the surface of. Epigenetic code that also gives indicators for 
how much food was around when your parents were children, when they were developing, um, how much noise was around, was there uh, physical, verbal violence, uh, was there drug use, was there, what, what sort of things could have impacted your, your DNA? And we're learning more and more about how the things that we wouldn't think could possibly affect our physical reality, our bodies, our, our genetics, really do. So something as, as seemingly minuscule as abusive speech in utero while you're still inside the womb developing can methylate portions of your DNA and prevent them from being transcribed. I'm not going to get into that because it, it's sort of a, a long explanation to, to get to what transcription and stuff is, but the way your DNA is copied is called transcription. Methylation can block and keep that DNA from unwinding so that the trans, transcription process can happen. Polymerase comes along and, and copies that DNA into an RNA sequence. And then that RNA is used as a template to create new DNA. Methylation can occur from speech. I'm, I want to say that again. The methylation of your DNA that prevents transcription can happen from speech. That is monumental. It's, it's almost inconceivable that speech could affect something at the level of physical reality. It's crazy. Like uh, you, you would imagine uh, someone speaking, uh, their words were like daggers. You know, that's, a, that's an uh, alliterative, I think is the word, metaphorical, whatever, but literally slicing your DNA with words. Long story short, 20, 30, 40% of your personality is the result of your environment. 60, 70, 80% of your personality and IQ are genetic. So the majority, a vast majority of you was determined at the moment that sperm touched egg. So how do we correct that when you're an adult, we don't, we can't. I can put you in the best school. I can give you the best friends. I can have the best parents for you, the best job to set you up for success. And it may make a difference in outcome. However, it will not change you as a person fundamentally. This is why we can't talk about IQ and personality as predictors for life outcomes. Because there's nothing we can do about it. We can focus on equity, but anytime we centralize power and I appoint a person or a board or a committee to ensure equity, the biases of that committee affect the process by which we bring about equity. And if I appoint, let's say, 10 people to be on this equity committee, I've just eliminated 329 million people who might have an idea that's better than the committee proposes for bringing about equitable distribution of whatever. We can't manage the problem we're trying to manage, especially if we refuse to identify out loud what the problem is. The problem is that people, and this is you know, a, a, a loaded term, I guess, but it means what I mean it to mean. People are differently abled. People ha there is disparity between one individual and the next in terms of a number of variables, an infinite number of variables. Everything from height and eye color to conscientiousness and agreeableness to uh, physical health, all cause mortality. 
there are differences between individuals. Those differences between individuals will inevitably produce differences in outcome. I can't manage a race between three people who run at different speeds and make sure that they all cross the finish line at the same time. It's beyond me as a person. I could have three people managing those three people and still not keep them all crossing the finish line at precisely the same time. I could start one ahead, one on the line and one behind, and still I can't equalize every variable because the only variable I'm adjusting is distance from the finish line. The only variable I'm adjusting is running speed. I can't, I can't process all of the variables. We tend to think in terms of univariant analysis. This is where you get things like uh, the gender wage gap, things like that. That's a univariant analysis. I add up all the wages, I divide it by male and female uh, wage earners, and I say there's more in the male category, but I, I omit all the other data that explains why there is more money in the male pile than the female pile. Our limitations in cognition produce more problems when we try and solve problems that are created by our limitations in cognition. That's probably a confusing sentence. It made sense as I was saying it. We're unequal and we can't, we can't make ourselves equal. We can provide equality of access. We can provide quality of opportunity but we can't provide equality of outcome. It's not possible. Those differences in ability, those differences in individuals, produce the Pareto distribution I described. They produce the Fibonacci sequence in um, creativity. Our minds are different, our bodies are different, our reality is different. There is no way to cater to every individual reality and ensure an equal outcome. What does this have to do with technology? As our, our society grows increasingly more complex, those least able to deal with increasing complexity are going to become more and more depressed into the bottom of that Pareto distribution so that it's not just the 10% of the population that has an IQ below 85 that needs welfare and housing benefits and food stamps and etc. It won't just be 10% of the population because automation, for example, will get rid of entry-level jobs for skillless workers. Automation will start planting crops and harvesting crops and selling crops and transporting crops and refueling the machines that produce the crops. A machine will take your order and provide your food. A machine will clean the floors and scrub the dishes. A machine will take you from point A to point B. A machine will generate problems to generate solutions to the problems that are provided by a human input or a computer will analyze a system, identify problems, generate solutions, and then enact those solutions. So that 10% of the population becomes 20%. That 20% becomes 40%. That 40% becomes 60%. And you can see where that goes. Those least able to adapt to increasing complexity are going to be worse and worse and worse and worse off. And this is something that we don't want to talk about on the left or the right. Again, we don't have the solution to it. And we're unwilling to say that this difference in outcome is the result of individual ability. We have to have these conversations and we have to approach them dispassionately so that we can make appropriate decisions about how we prevent the collapse of global society. If people can't find jobs, what do they do? Well, you either 
cheat rob steal or you use the government to steal from producers what happens when the producers can no longer produce enough to sustain themselves and the population that cannot be productive what happens when they can become so disenfranchised and and broken down and miserable that they just stop working This has disastrous consequences, and, and I don't hear, well, I do hear a few, a very select few people talking about these ideas. The, the intellectual dark web, as it's known. There are people discussing these issues, but you're not going to hear it on the news. You're not going to hear politicians or presidents or celebrities talk about these issues because they're infinitely complex. They require layered abstraction, their high IQ topics that have a million moving parts, and they're highly emotionally charged. So it takes a certain type of person to be able to have a conversation like this with another person of like mind to prevent getting emotionally invested and and charged and, and making decisions that are irrational making statements that are irrational. It takes a special kind of person to do that. And not everyone has that ability because we are different in our abilities. Long story short, we have a society that is ever increasing in its complexity. And we have a population that is not. Automation is going to replace human beings at all levels eventually but the canary in the coal mine is the low skill or skillless laborers at the bottom of the Pareto distribution when we see the canary begin to get dizzy I should explain that example if you don't know what the canary in the coal mine means coal miners would become exposed to noxious gases and poisonous gases down deep in the earth There's no ventilation system. This is early coal mining. So they would keep uh, a candle burning, let's say, and the candle might go out if if there's not enough oxygen to sustain life. Or you would have a canary in a cage. And if you notice the canary dies, now you know you need to get the fuck out of that cavern. It's, It's, you're approaching the point of no return. So this canary in the coal mine, historically, has been the poorest Americans. Uh, We need to observe not just what is happening to the canary in our coal mine, but we need to start generating hypotheses without emotion as to why the canary is affected. And rather than point to just the canary and say, well, perhaps there are intrinsic qualities to the canary that make it predisposed to suffer, or only looking at externalities and societal causes for the canary's inability to thrive. Like everything else, the solution, the answer, lies somewhere in between that. We know that canaries differ in their ability. And we know that there are societal factors that inhibit the flourishing of that canary. And yet, we think in terms of binary through conditioning and limitations in our psychology. It's either this or it's this, and there's nothing in between. We gotta start talking about it. What I see that has the highest correlation for outcome, if I wanna predict outcome, I have IQ and I have personality. Those are the 
intrinsic qualities of the canary that I can measure and I can use for their predictive quality and they accurately predict outcome. Next, I need to look at the externalities. I need to look at the, the societal um, variables that either enhance or inhibit the natural abilities of that canary that I can measure. I need these societal factors to be objective and measurable. I can't just say systemic oppression of women. Okay, point to it. Show it to me so that we can do something about it. I have to be able to quantify it. I have to be able to at least observe it in a way that I can show someone else so that we can do something about it. Just saying oppression, patriarchy, racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, whatever. Those aren't hypotheses and they aren't solutions. We have to start talking in terms of actionable information. We have to start meeting between the qualitative and the quantitative data that we're discussing. One side, the right brain, is especially adept at voicing concerns about qualitative, feeling-oriented, intuition-oriented information. And that information has value. The left brain doesn't see its value. And then we have another side of the population that is focused only on the quantitative. I need to be able to measure it. I need to be able to weigh it. I need to be able to determine its mass, its volume, its characteristics. The left brain knows that this is the way to come about the answer. The answer is in the corpus callosum. The answer is in the mediary. The thing that can interpret and speak and internalize and understand the language that both sides are speaking. This is where the answer lies. That line that distinguishes chaos and order. The line down the center where the cross intersects. The the line that divides every man's heart. The Aristotelian mean. There are a million ways to say this. The right side isn't right. The right brain isn't right. The left side isn't right. The left brain isn't right. But they both have something to offer and we have to figure out how we're going to pile up this information, get rid of the chaff, chaff, chaff I think is the word, separate the wheat from the chaff. We have to get rid of the, the irrelevant information and take the best of both arguments, combine them, and generate as many possible solutions as we can. This is how we address the problem. This is how we take steps toward mitigating the problem. I don't believe this is a problem that can be solved in the sense of, of the word that we think, solving something. This isn't something that can be solved because these are intrinsic qualities. And these are qualities that are intrinsic to the the society we've built, the system we've built. Unless we want to just collapse everything and descend into this Mad Max type of world or, or become uh, the collapsing Soviet Union or, or something like that, we, we, can't, we can't demolish the pyramid. We have to identify the, the gaps and patch the pyramid. We have, to, we have to adapt and improvise in generating solutions to these problems and understand that we're never going to solve them. That's a, that's a crucial component to this. We can mitigate, but we can't eliminate. That's all I got, guys. Hope you get some value out of that. We will see you.